and it's going to start right we are now live on air with a very special guest we have uh, john grunsfeld who is not just a hero but like a superhero when it comes to space terms i mean i have had the privilege of interviewing astronauts and chief scientists but you are all of that packaged in one and not only that you've been to space five times how did you get that right well the the truth is i think i'm really lucky to be able to have gone to space once uh, but to go five times was beyond my expectations my dream as a as a young boy maybe six or seven years old was to become an astronaut this was when we hadn't even gone to the moon yet uh, we had just launched the first people in space and i thought that was very cool and I thought that would be something I'd like to do. And so my lifetime dream was to go in space once, but flying in space is very exciting and very addictive. Uh, and so after my first flight, I thought, boy, I'd love to go again and again and again. In fact, uh, I'm happiest when I'm in space. So I definitely could live in space if it were possible. Well, what I'd like to do is just go back a little bit. What is it that you studied? Where did you go? Um, because, you know, when, whenever I interview astronauts and people in the science field, I always ask, what was that turning point? So, yes, obviously people going to space might have been something that you were interested in, but did you have a turning point at some point in your life? Well, I think, you know, the, the real passion that I had as a child was for science. And I loved math because it allowed me to do science. And I, I you know, used to explore in the woods and at the beach. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, so we were very lucky to be near Lake Michigan, uh, you know, which to me looked like an ocean. Uh, you mm -hmm. couldn't, can't see the other side. And there were fossils on the shore. And so as a young boy, I used to think, well, maybe I'll be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs or a geologist. But I loved all different kinds of science. And throughout my childhood, I studied lots of science, lots of math, uh, worked very hard. You know, I was definitely a, a nerdy kid. Um, and throughout high school as well. I started working in the laboratory with my teachers doing experiments. Uh, things would break in the lab uh, over the normal course of events and I would take them home, laboratory equipment, spectrophotometers or other experiments, uh, and fix them. And I learned how to fix things. Uh, you know, I also like to work on cars. So then through college, I studied physics and physics and astronomy. I wanted to study black holes and neutron stars. The idea of becoming an astronaut was a childhood dream, but it was just a dream. It didn't seem like it was possible or a reality. So I focused on what I really loved, which was learning about nature, learning about the universe, staring up at the stars at night and wondering, are there any planets around those stars? Is anybody out there? I was also an avid science fiction fan. And so I loved Star Trek and 2001 A Space Odyssey and later Star Wars. And so this was just, you know, what I liked to do. When I uh, went to graduate school, uh, I actually started sending my own experiments to space. And this was very exciting, both on very high altitude balloons going to the edge of space. Uh, and then on uh, an experiment on the space shuttle was actually my thesis for my doctorate. Uh, and working with the, the NASA uh, team, you know, really cemented that idea uh, that maybe I could go to space someday. So when I got my PhD, my doctorate in physics, I filled out an application and sent it off and thought, okay, you know, we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Uh, but now, were you ever turned, I mean, you weren't turned down. Were you accepted straight away? No, actually, my first application uh, was, uh, turned down, so to speak, but I actually got an interview my first time. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, they must interview thousands of people. And I got to Houston, uh, and there were only 20 of us. And so I was a little uh, shocked at you know how extensive it was. It was one week long, and the actual interview was only one hour, and the rest of the week was all medical testing. So it was actually rather unpleasant. <laughs> 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 and... At, at the end, I did ask for a, a debrief. I, I called the person who was running the, the process and said, well, how did I do? And they said, well, you got very close. They said, uh, in the field of space science, which is quite broad, 
uh, we interviewed, you know, 20 people and we selected two and you were number three. So I thought, hey, that's pretty good. So a year later, another call for astronauts, I applied again. Uh, and this time I knew the process. I knew, you know, what was going to happen. I could prepare for it. It wasn't just this out of the blue mystery. Mm -hmm. And so I did prepare for it and came up with, you know, some ideas of how to, you know, strengthen my application and interviewed again and I was selected. So, I mean, there's obviously a lesson there. I mean, you know, if at first you, you fail, then try, try again. But it was something that you were determined to do, though. Well, cer certainly it was. But in the meantime, I had moved from University of Chicago, where I did my PhD, to California Institute of Technology. And I was having the time of my life. I was observing on a big telescope on Mount Palomar. Uh, I observed on a radio telescope. Uh, you know, you have... Uh, radio telescopes in, in Africa and big telescopes. Um, mm -hmm. And also I had experiments on spacecraft. So I, you know, I couldn't have been happier. We had just launched the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, one of the NASA great observatories. Uh, and I was an investigator on that. So I had more science than I could possibly do. I was living in California, which is great, climbing mountains and going to the ocean. So life couldn't have been better. And I think that's, there's sort of a message there that, uh, you know, it's important to, to work very hard, to try and be happy, to find something that you love. And then if there's something else you want to do, you know, it's much more likely to happen when you're doing great than if you're doing really poorly and you're trying to do something else. So you reckon that uh, you almost attracted yourself to that position because you were in the right frame of mind and, and positive people attract positive people. And maybe when you went into the interview, because you were at such a happy space, they kind of connect with you. I mean, that might have, it's, it's almost like the, the way the planets interact with each other. There's, a, there's a, some sort of hidden secret connection between all the planets. Maybe you had this way to, to get people to gravitate towards you. Um, well, I, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Although there actually is a connection between the planets. It's called gravity. And the planets actually do align themselves into what are called resonances, where they're stable. So early in the solar system, the planets were all circling around and moving in and out. And eventually, you know, they've gotten into this point where they reinforce themselves to stay in their orbits. And we see that in other planetary systems, too. But I think the, the message is that, uh, you know, when you're very successful and you're working very hard and other people can recognize that, it gives you a certain credibility, a certain, you know, sense. Other people will see that, ah, here's somebody who is su very successful in their current job, and it's a new job. They'll probably also be successful in the one, you know, that we want to select you for. Uh, and so also when later on as I was, you know, a senior astronaut looking at applications of other astronauts, I used the same metric. Wow. So now you, you've done your studies. You're having a great time, then all of a sudden your application gets accepted and they say to you, uh, look, John, we actually need you as an astronaut. What was that first feeling like when, you, when it actually sunk in and you realized it was actually going to happen? Uh, well, I'm a, uh, as I say, I'm, you know, I'm a great uh, science fiction fan and I don't know if you know, the, the kids there watch Star Trek you know, or know, you know Vulcan. Um, uh -huh. I, I'm kind of a Vulcan person. I don't have like really big highs or really big lows in life. Uh, and, and so, you know, I was very excited, um, but it wasn't, you know, sort of explosive or anything like that. I was just, wow, you know, this might really happen. And of course, there's multiple stages. First is to be selected as an astronaut candidate. Then you have to go to astronaut school, which is about two years long. Uh, I think I was more excited when I was offered my first flight, uh, which was you know just about a year after I arrived. So wow, that was that's pretty quite exciting. A yeah. Yep, I, I mean, I flew, generally, yeah, do you I, generally have a fast turnaround like that? Well, I was selected in 1992 in August, and I flew in March of 1995. So that's very quick. I was the first in my class to be assigned. That is awesome. But now you. We're very fortunate in that you went up on five shuttle missions. Which one was the most memorable? And I've got a funny feeling it might involve the hugging 
of a certain Hubble. Am I correct? <laughs> so indeed, I flew five times to space. Uh, my first mission was spending uh, 17 days orbiting the Earth with a suite of telescopes, three telescopes in the payload bay. And we operated as a, a space-borne observatory 24 hours a day. We did 12-hour shifts. My second mission, I went to the Russian Mir space station. And that was very exciting. It was kind of like going to a, a cabin, you know, distant in the woods, except this time mm -hmm. it's a little cabin in space. And then the next three missions were to the Hubble Space Telescope. And my first mission to the Hubble was, of course, very exciting. The Hubble Space Telescope is, you know, the most uh, amazing scientific instrument ever built by humans. It's discovered more things and unraveled the mysteries of the universe for us. And when I went up there, it was broken, so we got to fix it. So again, going back to my high school days, I learned how to fix things. And so, you know, that was my specialty, was fixing the Hubble Space Telescope. And I, I did a good job, so they sent me back two times more. Uh, you know, I think, you know, my first mission is very memorable because it was my you know, first time going to space. And, you know, it's really a, a special privilege and amazing to be able to float, fly like Superman, look at the, the beautiful Earth. Uh, but the last mission to the Hubble, STS-125, which was in May of 2009, uh, is probably my favorite mission only because it was by far the most difficult, the most challenging, and we were completely successful. So we didn't break the Hubble, uh, we, we improved it. And one of the reasons why it's my favorite mission is because the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, even though it was eight years ago, is still operating perfectly. So we're very excited about that. That is awesome. And I mean, having a telescope in space is, is great, but they've now got a rather more uh, technologically advanced version, uh, the James Ellis uh, Telescope. Is that correct? So it's called the James Webb, W-E-D. Well, James Webb. James. I'm just thinking James Ellis, the rugby trophy. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> the James Webb trophy. <laughs> yep, um, the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's actually different than Hubble. And the really good news is uh, its launch date is October 2018. It's going to launch from South America on a European rocket. That's part of the European contribution. But that's coming up really quick, a year and a half. And so we hope that both Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope get to operate at the same time. So you'll have those two telescopes. Now, the Hubble operates in the same light that we see with our eyes, the visible band, so the colors of the rainbow. And so all these beautiful pictures you see from Hubble are similar to the pictures that you, know, you would see if you were in a spaceship zooming out to those distant galaxies. Whereas the James Webb Space Telescope sees an infrared light. It's light that's invisible to us um, and is redder than red. That's why we call it infrared. Uh, and so it can see things that Hubble can't, and Hubble can see things that James Webb can't. So the two together are really going to be very powerful. Wow. Well, I know that there are lots of questions that some of the students will have. I know Mr. McNulty's group have to leave, and we've got a lot of online viewers who are watching this live while it's streaming. So I'm going to switch to Mr. McNulty's group. Do you want to ask some questions? They're coming. They're coming. <laughs> All right. Looking sure. forward. Come on up, James. Do you want to ask first? James, we're going to let her ask first, okay? You, oh, in a minute? Five times. Okay, this is James. Hi, James. Hi. Do I ask a question now? Yes. Okay. Yes. How many, how many things have the Hubble telescope discovered? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, Hubble has you know, done so many uh, millions of observations, literally. Um, but I think that, you know, the Hubble was originally designed to do a few things, to measure the expansion rate of the universe. The universe started in this, you know, violent time and then expanded very rapidly. And it was hoped that we would be able to look at galaxies that were half the age of the universe. Well, in fact, Hubble did that measurement, but not only has it seen back halfway to the beginning of the universe, it's seen back 
about 90% of the way back to the beginning of the universe, to when galaxies, the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. And the reason we see back in time is that the speed of light is finite. It's not infinitely fast. And so the light that we see here at Earth from a distant galaxy took time to get to us, traveling at the speed of light. And if the universe is 13.7 billion years old, Hubble can see back 13 billion years, or actually about 13.3 billion years back to the earliest galaxies. If the universe were a human, it's as if we're looking at galaxies when they were just becoming toddlers, when they were just first learning to walk, perhaps. Uh, and so Hubble saw that. The other thing Hubble was designed to do was to determine whether black holes are real or not. At the time Hubble was launched, uh, there was a theory that black holes exist, but we didn't actually know for sure. And Hubble observed the gas swirling around one of these stars that looked like it might be a black hole. And sure enough, the, the material was so swirling around so fast and so close to the star that the only conclusion is that it must be a black hole. And so we determined, in fact, that black holes really do exist. Now, a lot of the things Hubble was designed to do uh, we never imagined. For instance, as we were studying the expansion of the universe, uh, all the theories told us that the universe should be slowing down as it gets bigger because everything is pulling on each other due to gravity. And when we actually measured it, we found out that it's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And this is a big mystery. This is one of the greatest mysteries of all in science. Maybe one of you will discover what it's called, what it's due to. And they called it dark energy and it's actually the acceleration of the universe, uh, and it accounts for about 75% of all the energy in the universe. So it's a big factor, and we have no idea what it is. In 2011, the three scientists who discovered it using the Hubble uh, won the Nobel Prize in physics. So that's how big a deal it was. The other thing Hubble uh, was not designed to do, but has been able to pioneer, is the study of planets around nearby stars. When Hubble was launched in 1990, we only knew about nine planets in the entire universe, our own solar system. And then Pluto was demoted and we were down to eight planets because Pluto is a dwarf planet. What uh, we discovered using Hubble and other satellites is that stars have solar systems just like ours and we're surrounded by solar systems. And so Hubble has been actually able to observe planets around nearby stars and study their atmospheres to see what they're made of. And when Hubble was launched, we didn't know about any of this. So it's pretty incredible that this telescope has been so uh, you know, useful in all these different areas. And we're still discovering things every day. Sure, that is amazing. Now I know that uh, Ms. McDonald, you are leaving soon. So I'm gonna let you ask another question. And then I know that uh, the other two or three classrooms have all got questions too. So fire away. <laughs> Hey, I'm Bella, and um, I was wondering what was the process in getting ready to take off to the, like, the space? Sure. Hi, Bella. <laughs> Typically, uh, we, we go to school as astronauts. We're called astronaut candidates for about two years to learn all the fundamentals. You know, how the shuttle works, how the radio systems work, how the computers work, how the shuttle flies, space shuttle flies, and it's similar with the Soyuz rocket that we're flying now. Uh, once we have all the basics, then we start the specific training for a mission. And for the Hubble Space Telescope mission, that takes about two to three years of learning all of the tasks, building tools, practicing in the spacesuit, uh, learning how to run the shuttle, learning how to grab Hubble with the robotic arm, you know, all those things takes about two years. Uh, two to three years of practice, uh, and then we get to go to space. A lot of work for about two weeks in space, but it's super important. I can imagine. Thanks, now, I know Barbara's class, their, their microphone's not working, but uh, I'm going to read some of the questions. Uh, Nathan wants to know, how does it feel to be in space? Is it actually moving? Do you feel like you're moving all the time or just floating and staying in one position? So the way that I feel is truly magical. I mean, it's just an incredible experience. But to specifically answer your question, Nathan, when you're in space on the space shuttle orbiting the Earth, uh, 
you're actually falling towards the earth. You're in free fall. And you'd think, well, if you're falling towards the earth, why don't you hit the earth? And the answer is, you're going so fast that as you go around the earth, let's find an earth. Maybe it's I have an earth. these things at your table. <laughs> okay. I don't have an earth, but I do have a moon. Uh -huh. and if you think if you were standing still, sure enough, you'd fall straight towards the surface. But if you're going fast enough, as you fall, the curvature of, in this case, the moon, but the curvature of the earth and your falling rate match perfectly, then you just keep going round and round. So inside of the spacecraft, you just feel like you're always falling, which after you get used to it, means you sort of feel motionless. Because inside of the space shuttle, it's falling, you're falling at exactly the same rate. So you just float there motionless, even though you're going uh, at 22,000 kilometers an hour, 17,500 miles an hour. Wow. And then there was another question. Um, the, the, the one question we'll get to at the end, uh, Cass wants to know what the requirements are to become an astronaut, but we'll chat about that a little bit later. Um, he wants to know, is it possible for the James Webb Telescope and the Hubble to combine? When we get the, the images and the data on the ground, we can combine the two images, you know, make them the same size and overlap them so we can see you know, what the differences are between the visible light and the infrared light. But uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting the Earth, and the James Webb Space Telescope, we're going to send a million miles away from Earth. I mentioned that it's an infrared telescope. An infrared light is the light that we give off as heat. So sometimes maybe you have a fire in your fireplace uh, and you feel that heat. That's actually infrared light traveling from the fire to you and you f absorb it on your skin and it feels like heat. It's not, not actually the air that you feel that's hot, it's the infrared light. And that's what Hubble will, that's what the James Webb will see. Now the problem is the earth is really hot. You know, it's you know about uh, 20 degrees C or about 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 290 degrees Kelvin. And so if you wanna see things that are really cold, far into the infrared, you have to be far away from the earth. Otherwise, the heat of the earth will heat up your telescope and all you'll see is a fuzz. Uh, so we're sending it far away. So it's not actually possible to join them together. Sure, so you obviously can't join it together. But now, I, I know that um, Tonya's class <laughs> might have some questions. And Tony just joined us as well. Um, Tonya, do, do you have any questions from your group? Good, Jackson. <laughs> yeah. um, did anybody doubt you? And if they did, what would you do? Did they doubt me? Is that your question? Yeah, that's like, a good question. Did, I mean, well, did you doubt yourself? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, anytime I try something really hard, I always have doubts. But your question is very insightful. Uh, you know, that means it's you know, really a great question because one of the things we did on this last mission in May of 2009 was to try and repair one of the scientific instruments in the telescope while we were on orbit. Normally we bring up new cameras and just replace, take out the old camera, put in a new camera, but we couldn't do that with this one. So we had to actually take off tiny little screws. I might even have one, but you wouldn't be able to see it. I had to take off a whole panel with tiny screws, pull out circuit cards, put in new circuit cards, all the while wearing those big bulky gloves in my spacesuit. And actually we had a lot of people who NASA hired to review our, our tasks to make sure that it made sense. And they said, this doesn't make any sense. We don't think you'll be successful. We don't think you should try it. It's a waste of time because you won't succeed and you could do something more important. Uh, you know, that because you'll, you know, use time on orbit and time is very limited, you should try and do something easier. And I was the Hubble commander and I said, thank you very much for your input. You know, we appreciate it, but we're going to go do it anyway because it's so important to science. <laughs> uh, and in fact, that particular task I practiced over and over again. I had a small version of the, the camera and every night I would practice with my little screwdriver wearing gloves uh, and frequently t doing the whole task uh, on a real camera and also underwater in the spacesuit practicing. So when I went to orbit, 
uh, I knew every screw by name. You know, I could tell you what screw that was. And the task went perfectly. And that's the camera that allowed those scientists to win the Nobel Prize in physics. Wow. So now when you think back to, to the, the choice of actually going ahead and, and not following the guidance from the ground, but going with your instinct, I mean, that is, it takes a lot of guts because if it didn't pay off, then the buck stops with you. Yep, but you know we're risking our lives to go to space, and the Hubble is something that I view as very important. Uh, so that it was worth the risk, uh, certainly, and to do that. Absolutely. Plus, you know, I, I had a lot of confidence in my abilities, but more importantly, I had a lot of confidence in the team, and that's not just the team that we had on orbit. Uh, my spacewalking partner, Drew Feustel, uh, and he's getting ready to go up to the space station next year. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the team of scientists and engineers on the ground who are you know, supporting us. So uh, when you have a great team, you can achieve almost anything. That is amazing. And now I know Mr. Soskill's class, uh, you guys had a question as well? Yeah, can you hear us? We can. Okay, go ahead again. How long can you stay in space? I, I couldn't how, hear that very well. How long can you, say, can you stay in space? Ah. Uh, well, the, you know, the longest I've been in space is 17 days at one time. Uh, on the International Space Station, we routinely have people who stay six months in space. And the world record uh, for an American at once is 340 days uh, set by Scott Kelly. And I flew with Scott on my second flight, uh, sorry, on my third flight up to the, uh, the Hubble. Um, and the answer is, if you, you know, really, so far, we don't know what the limit is. Uh, on how long people can live in space in free fall. But the key to being healthy in space is to eat well, good nutrition, and to exercise regularly, which is the same key that it is to stay healthy on Earth, which makes total sense. Well, I mean, that's actually a very interesting question because one of the reasons that we are having this discussion is because the Humans to Mars Summit will be coming up uh, starting tomorrow, if I recall correctly. And they're going to be discussing getting to Mars. And, and getting to Mars is not an easy process. Um, and, and, and probably spending a year on the space station is, is, a, is good practice for, for a mission like that. But, but why are we choosing to go to Mars now? Should we have been doing it earlier? Should we be doing it later? What is your take on the whole matter? Well, I, you know, I think uh, we probably could not have done it earlier uh, with the knowledge that we had, although we certainly could have tried. And what I find so amazing is uh, about where we are today is that for the first time in human history, we have the rockets you know, with... Uh, the new space launch system, which is a very big rocket, um, but also rockets from other companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX, they're building rockets. So we have a fleet of rockets to get things to space. And we've had for now over a decade, the International Space Station, which has told us that, you know, people can spend six to eight months in space and still be strong and still be capable. And, uh, you know, that's about the amount of time it takes to get to Mars. So we have the knowledge of you know, humans, of people, the medical knowledge, and we have the rockets to get there. Uh, and from our robotic science program, we have knowledge that there's water on Mars, that the atmosphere has all the kinds of gases that we need to survive, and that there's hints that Mars was certainly habitable about three and a half billion years ago. It was much like Earth, it had a blue sky, it had snow-capped peaks and rivers and lakes. And, you know, where did all that water go? Well, now it's underground. Where did the atmosphere go? It's been lost to space. So now it is a, a dry uh, place with not much atmosphere. But maybe life started on Mars back then at the same time life started on Earth. And if so, I think human explorers probably have the ingenuity and the perception and the capability uh, to go look in the rock record and see if we find fossils, to dig underground and see if we find extant life, microbes. Uh, I think that would be fascinating. 
Uh, and it's very hard to do with these little robots. They're very capable, but it's not like having, you know, some human geologist on the surface. So now, the, you, you, were very, you were very involved with, with sending Curiosity to Mars. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. And, and, now, and, and, and now there's a pre, uh, someone coming after Curiosity. Yep, we, ha we actually have a number of missions, but the really interesting one is called Mars 2020. Uh, it will probably have a name like Curiosity at some point. But in 2020, it's going to launch to Mars. And not only will it analyze the rocks, uh, have great cameras. It's going to have stereo cameras. It'll have microphones so we can listen to Mars. Uh, it'll have a, uh, two lasers that can zap rocks and find out what they're made out of. But more importantly, it's going to have a drill and some little sample containers. And it's going to put samples of Mars into those containers and put them aside so that a mission after that can grab the samples and bring them back to Earth uh, so that we can analyze them with the best instruments. Uh, and so that'll be very exciting. Uh, plus, I mean, that is very exciting. Plus, if in the 2020s, we can send a robot to the surface to pick up those samples, launch a rocket off the surface, and return those samples to Earth, that'll be the first time we've done a round trip to Mars. Uh, so if in the 2020s we can do a round trip to Mars with robots, then after that hopefully we can do a round trip with people. Now, I, I know NASA is quite conservative and, and they're talking 2030 for first humans on Mars, but Elon Musk obviously has a very different agenda and, and the Chinese possibly have a different agenda and, and possibly even Blue Origin. Everyone is eager to be the first person, the first team to get someone onto Mars. Where are you hedging your bets? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the cost and complexity of going to Mars is not to be underestimated. It's very hard to get to Mars. If it were easy, we already would have done it. Uh, and I don't believe that these companies have the resources, uh, you know, with the possible exception of Blue Origin, and they have other objectives, uh, to mount a mission to the Mars surface. And, you know, SpaceX uh, is a great company, but their efforts have been almost entirely funded by NASA. Uh, and so if, you know, if NASA decides to go off to Mars and doesn't fund SpaceX, you know, then they don't have a chance. And so I think the best option is a partnership. Uh, I think it's truly wonderful uh, that SpaceX is a company that's designed around exploration. Uh, it's, you know, space exploration technologies. And their, their goal is to send people to Mars. Uh, you know, lots of companies, Lockheed Martin, wants to send people to Mars as well. Uh, the difference is they're a very big company and they do lots of different things. You know, they build airplanes, they build ships. Uh, SpaceX only does rockets. And mm -hmm. so uh, the best is that it's a partnership between all of these companies. I think that's how it will actually happen. Now, I, I know that a lot of people are saying that, uh, you know, Getting to Mars, we could probably manage by 2030. Um, we've all seen the Mars National Geographic series, and uh, you know we know that it's possible, apparently. But the reality is that you know once you're there, life on Mars is is not so easy, and there are many risks involved. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What's it like on the surface? Well, in gen you know, for most people, they would say life in space is not so easy either. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you think about classical exploration, you know, all exploration, you know, is usually done by people who are very uh, tolerant of adversity. You know, if you think about, you know, the European explorers crossing the ocean in those ships, you know, that was no joyride. You know, that was tough. Uh, and their health suffered. You know, we discovered that you need vitamin C or you get scurvy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you can't just eat meat, you know, which doesn't have vitamin C in it. Um, a lot of people died on those missions, and you know many people died on the way back. Um, Antarctic exploration, you know, is you know fraught with peril even today, uh, with modern tools and techniques. Mountaineering, you know, uh, you know, climbing you know very big mountains like Mount Everest is you know, a dangerous thing to do and uh, very uncomfortable. You know, we call it type two fun. You know, mm -hmm. type one fun is when you have fun in the moment. Type two fun is where it's really awful, but afterwards you think, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, and you call that type two fun. But uh, like space, space flight is like that. And, you know, Mars 
you know, isn't a tropical paradise. You know, it's a desert. Uh, and you ha always have to have a spacesuit on. And, you know, if, you're, if your spaceship or spacesuit fails, uh, you know, you could easily die. And so it's, it's a challenging environment. But that's, you know, that's what people do. And, and there are some people uh, who thrive with, with adversity. They're actually happier when things are tough. You know, I'm, I'm kind of one of those per people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't like to be too comfortable. <laughs> now, I saw that uh, there was a, another question possibly from Tonya's class. Um, uh, one of the, a couple of the kids wanted to ask a question. So, Tonya, you want to give them a chance to ask? Sure. Let's see. Come here. Hurry up. Sorry. How long does it take to get to the Hubble telescope and then to Mars? They had to leave and go do a test real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the Hubble telescope is orbiting the Earth, uh, and it takes only eight and a half minutes to get from Florida to Earth orbit. Um, but then we had to catch the Hubble, and that took a couple of days. But in principle, you could get there in just about 40 minutes if you went straight away. Uh, so that's how long it takes to get to Earth orbit. Mars, on the other hand, is 20 million miles away, and it takes with current rocket technology, typically about six to nine months to get to Mars. So it's a long time. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can see that uh, Mrs. Soskill's class also got another question. Stand up. When, you, um, when you're flying, how do you go to the bathroom when there's zero gravity? How do you? Go to the bathroom. Oh, go to the bathroom. Thank oh, you. Oh, now that is one of the best questions I've heard. Yep. How do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> so you go, you go the same way you go on Earth from, you know, from your perspective, but you need special equipment. Uh, and so uh, if you've ever seen a bathroom on an airplane, uh, on the space shuttle, we actually have a little room kind of like that. Um, but on the toilet, uh, if, if you're a man or a woman, uh, if you want to go pee, you actually have to use a special little funnel and there's a fan that sucks air in, and you have to pee into the funnel, uh, and it gets sucked into a tank, because otherwise it would just float around, which would be really awful. Uh, if you have to go poop, then you have to sit down on a toilet, but you'd have to strap yourself down, because otherwise you'd float off. And the toilet, too, sucks air in, so all the poop goes into the toilet. So what that's do you do with the it. toilet roll floats around and you can't grab the toilet roll and you're attached to the toilet? <laughs> well, fortunately, you know, we instead of using a roll of toilet paper, we have them kind of like Kleenex boxes. So you pull out one sheet at a time. <laughs> that would make, you see, a lot of thought has to go into that. That's right. And, and, and what happens and we when also the one. Use the, we also use wet wipes, you know, not just dry toilet paper, but wet wipes. And they actually have like the little bears on them, you know, they're. <laughs> you know, the, the soft wet wipes and and so what happens when the soft. toilet breaks down because I mean of all the essentials that you need in a space station or in a shuttle that's the last thing you need breaking down when you're there for a few days well on the space shuttle we only had one toilet and so several of us were trained on how to fix it unfortunately in five space shuttle flights I only had to fix the toilet once uh, and, you know, it was a relatively minor repair. Sometimes it happens that the toilet breaks down and nobody can use it. Uh, on the space shuttle, that's not so bad because they're short flights. On the space station, uh, it could be really bad. Uh, fortunately, the Russian toilet, which is what we use, is very reliable and easy to fix. Um, but if, if you end up in a situation where, you know, there's no toilet, uh, then you have to use plastic bags. And that gets really icky. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the reality. But then uh, from my very good friend, Don Thomas, he says that uh, the P gets reused. Yep, we actually... On the internet. We actually, you know, the going to Mars or living on the International Space Station, water is a precious resource. Um, now, water on Earth is a precious resource, too. Uh, for instance, when I brush my teeth, I wet the toothbrush and immediately turn the water off so that it doesn't just run in the sink because that would be wasteful. Well, the same is true in space. We have to be very careful with our water. Uh, and so it's so precious 
that we have a machine that we store the urine uh, and it filters out everything but the water and then we have the pure water and then a bunch of powder left over from the urine and the powder we throw away but all of the water we actually reuse wow and you obviously can't taste it in your coffee no <laughs> no i see some more questions on on uh, in fact i think it was tanya's class Did, there were some more questions Hmm. How about Jerry Collins? Jerry yeah. Collins, come on up. Go ask him a question. We're so excited. I'm such a NASA fan girl. <laughs> I think they're I think they're kind of uh frozen with uh, you know they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed, but thank you. This Can has been a, a really cool dream. Go ahead, Jared, hurry up. How do you like going to space? Hi, Jared. I, I love going to space. You know, I'm absolutely the most happy in space. Uh, I sleep really well. The interesting thing is, um, I, you know, I love eating in space because you can play with your food. You know, you can take your macaroni and cheese and put it on the spoon and let go of it. And it just stays there right in front of you, um, which, is, which is neat. Uh, we don't fly bread because bread would make a lot of crumbs, but we fly tortillas. And I like peanut butter and jelly tortillas. Um, and I love sleeping in space. I think the only thing that's that's not so much fun is the peeing and pooping in space, but you get used to it. Uh, so I, I would love to live in space if I could. That is awesome. But now, of course, sleeping isn't such a, a an easy thing to do. But, but when you're in the space shuttle, there's no up or down. And traditionally, you would think, well, I need to find a nice spot, but I can't sleep with my head at the bottom and my feet on top. But when you're in space, that, that doesn't make a difference. Yeah, for me, what I, I like to find someplace cold. I like to be cold when I sleep. And so typically, I would sleep in the airlock uh, with the hatch open, of course. Uh -huh. and, and so I sort of strung myself up so that, you know, I wasn't very tight. I wasn't up against a wall, just floating in the middle of the airlock. Uh, and that was the most comfortable for me. And, of course, your arms. You need to strap your arms to your body or something like that because they tend to float around. Yeah, that didn't seem, for some people, that's a big deal. It didn't seem to bother me. You know, they just, typically, they would just sort of float right in front of me. And, and obviously, you're not sitting there pushing buttons and launching uh, the next uh, section of the rocket to go fly somewhere else. Nope, no. Nope. Those things don't happen. So now I can see that uh, there's another question. I think it was Addison that wanted to ask a question. What's the scariest thing you've ever done in space? The scariest Sorry. thing you've ever done in space. Uh, the scariest thing I've ever done in space. Uh, well, you know, I think going outside in a cloth spacesuit into the vacuum, uh, in principle, should be really scary. But it turns out it it didn't bother me very much. I thought, you know, I have to trust the spacesuit. Um, the one thing that you know I got very nervous at was one day when I was doing uh, a radio show called Car Talk. And you can actually go on the web and hear the interview. But we arranged that I would call this public radio station to talk about cars. And I assumed that they were going to tell the interviewers, uh, called Click and Clack the Car Talk Brothers, that I was calling. And all of a sudden, uh, they said, go ahead, caller. You know, what's your name? And I realized that they hadn't told them first that I was calling and I had to come up with some story to tell them right away. And so that made <laughs> me very nervous, but uh, fortunately it turned out very well and it was a very funny show. It's a, it's a great show if you've never heard it and if you like cars. But now, of course, when you're in space, communication is key. Sending messages back to Earth now that we've uh, sent uh, New Horizons past Pluto, is there a chance that Pluto might be promoted again? Well, you know, it's a uh, an interesting question to a very few number of people. I think you know, <laughs> if if you call Pluto a dwarf planet, then you have to call Jupiter and Saturn giant planets, and then Neptune and Uranus are icy worlds, and Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets. 
Uh, so it's just, you know, being a little more specific by calling Pluto a dwarf planet. I mean, Pluto is a member of a class of objects, dwarf planets, that, you know, there may be thousands of them in our solar system. Uh, some of them probably larger than Pluto. We haven't discovered one yet, but it probably is out there just because there are so many large icy bodies uh, out beyond Pluto's orbit. Uh, and, you know, we've discovered a lot of those with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, there's a new telescope that will be operational in about four or five years that will probably discover thousands of, of planets in our own solar system that are dwarf planets. So the question is like the following. Uh, raise your hand if you have a dog. Okay, I see lots of hands going up. Okay. Now, you know, we have a rescue dog at my house. She weighs about 40 pounds. She has 10 different breeds. We have no idea what kind of dog she is. So she's a dog. She kind of looks like a dingo, actually, but uh, we just call <laughs> her a dog. Some people have chihuahuas. Does anybody have, you know, a miniature dog? Okay. So I see a few hands going up. So we could call those, you know, miniature dogs. Uh, or dwarf dogs, or chihuahuas, or whatever you want. And the question is, you know, are they dogs, or are they not? You know, are they just dwarf dogs, or are they dogs? And it's the same discussion about Pluto. Uh, uh -huh. you know, it's just a name. It's just a name, but it's but in, in your heart, it's still a planet. Actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that interested. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, there we go. That's, I'm, that's I'm, okay, it. I'm okay. I'm okay that it's a dwarf planet. Okay, <laughs> but now if, obviously, if if you're sending, for example, probes to go and visit other planets, and 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 Cassini is now having a lot of fun near Saturn, and and we've had Juno, which uh, you were also quite involved with, um, Mars is going to be very interesting because sending information back is one thing. What sort of data can we send, and at what resolution can we send it back to Earth? Because at the moment. The curiosity: What is the highest resolution images we can get, and and what is the next Mars 2020 going to have that Curiosity doesn't have? Well, right now, uh, most of the the images that are taken on Mars stay on Mars, and that's because we don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the good internet to get everything back from Mars. You know, we have to hmm. stream it very slowly, and so we send back low resolution pictures. Scientists look at them and engineers, and then they decide which of those pictures to send back at the highest resolution. And the, one of the neat things about the Mars 2020 rover is we will have stereo cameras and zoom lenses, and we'll be able to send those back in high definition. But that depends on having good orbital communication satellites. Uh, so we're still working on that. We should have a couple there. Um, but we won't have high-speed internet until we someday send an optical communications orbiter. And we're hoping to do that early in the 2020s, where we'll truly have high wow. bandwidth and we'll be able to get all of the really high-resolution uh, images back. Uh, that is amazing. So, so I mean, we, we, we're now going to, to land people on Mars. We know that it's not the easiest place to, to live. Um, when we find all the things we want to find, do you think we're going to colonize or settle on Mars? Of all the planets in our solar system, of all the moons in our solar system, of all the dwarf planets, I think Mars is really the only one where we can, in the true sense of colonization, uh, send people to Mars where they could live indefinitely. Uh, you need to have a certain level of, of natural resources to be independent. Uh, and Mars has the advantage that it, it has a reasonable surface gravity. Uh, it's a little over a third of our own gravity. It has an atmosphere, which is important, thin, but nevertheless important. And in that atmosphere, it has all the ingredients we need uh, to produce oxygen, to breathe. It has nitrogen, it has argon. And in the soil, it has all the ingredients we would need to raise plants. Uh, and also water, copious amount, a lot of water on Mars. It's just underground in the form of ice. Uh, one of the missions I'd like to see in the future is a mapping mission to map where all of that ice is underground. So you could pick a spot to land where it would be just a few meters below the surface rather than you know major effort. Uh, but we need to map all of that out. Uh, so 
you know, Mars is really the most Earth-like of all the planets in our solar system, and I think the next step for humanity. Uh, living on the moon, you know, is really tough for a bunch of reasons, uh, one of which is day and night. You know, day is 14 days long and night is 14 days long, so it gets incredibly cold at night. Uh, there's no, no appreciable water that's available on the moon. There's some theories about water at lunar poles, um, but that will be very hard to get and very hard to use because it's incredibly uh, cold in those lunar craters, 40, 40 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, and so that ice will be, you know, the hardness of granite, very hard to mine. If it's even there, we don't even know. And so the moon is a place we can visit and we could make a, an outpost, but I don't think people, you know, in the near term will, will try and live there, you know, for, you know, their lifetimes. Whereas on Mars, it, it would be possible. Difficult. Now, quick question. You obviously retired from NASA, and my definition of the word retire means to retire, to put new tires on so that you can then explore the kinds of projects that, that are interesting to you. What are you up to at the moment? So, I'm, I'm, right now, I'm talking to some wonderful classes and students. Uh, I know, not a very funny joke. Uh, so no, I'm, no, no. I mean, this is I'm getting something uh, you enjoy. So, I, so I, still love, I still love science. I love communicating science. And I'm actually using uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and the SOFIA Observatory. SOFIA is an airplane with a large infrared telescope in it. And we're looking at the moon of Jupiter called Europa. And what we're looking for is signs of water leaking out from Europa's undersea ocean. And so it's amazing that with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've seen indications that at the south pole of Europa, uh, water is shooting out from cracks in the ice, which is from an undersea ocean. And Europa is a really interesting moon. It's very large. It's the size of our moon. Uh, it's covered in ice. And at the core is a rocky core. And in between the ice and the rocky core is water. And it's salty water. And it's warm. It's melted. Uh, and that warm, salty water has been like that for four and a half billion years. And the question is, wow. if life is easy to start, you know, there's your soup, your soup of life, where life could have started. And sometime in, in the early 2020s, we're sending a mission to Europa that will, if we verify, will fly through those plumes of water and will tell us if there's any signs of life on Europa. Uh, in which case, if we find life on Europa, then we know we're not alone in the universe. There has to be someone else out there. So, so to cut a long story short, you're not really retired as such. Your heart is still in it. Your passion is in it. And, and you'll be involved in it for, for the rest of your life because it obviously is something that's very close to your heart. Absolutely. Yep. That is awesome. Now, I know that you've got a very hard cut off in seven minutes. Yep. So what advice would you give young people? One of the questions that one of the, the students asked earlier was, you know, in terms of requirements of becoming an astronaut, uh, in your view, and, and you've been involved in this process as well, a couple of times and, and also on the other side, sitting on the other side of the table, uh, enrolling people into to NASA. Um, what is it that would make a good astronaut in the future? Well, my first advice uh, is, you know, for all the students is to find, you know, something you like doing, you know, that you're very passionate about, that is just so much fun, you, you have to do it. Uh, and whether that's math or science or art or writing or being a doctor, you know, whatever, you know, your dreams are, you know, that you just love doing, you know, that's what you should work hard in uh, and, and use your passion. Uh, the next thing I would say, uh, again, for life, but also to become an astronaut, uh, is to stay in really good shape, to be fit, uh, to do lots of exercise, and, uh, you know, to do exercise like running uh, or climbing, um, but also, you know, things that involve lifting weights, uh, you, you know, because uh, especially as, as a young person, you know, your bones are growing, and they'll continue to grow until you're in your 20s, and that's your opportunity to make your bones as strong as possible. Uh, and after you get into your 20s, just the way human physiology works, it's much harder to make your bones stronger and denser. And if you have the chance to go to space, uh, you know, they, they may get weaker unless you work out 
and do a lot of weightlifting, which is hard in space. You have to work, you know, against resistance. Uh, so for the rest of your life, but also if you want to be an astronaut, you want to stay really fit. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, you know, learn how to fix things. Uh, you want to be able to fix your spacecraft. You want to be able to fix your bicycle or your car uh, or an airplane maybe. Um, and so being good with tools, being good with computers, being good with electronics uh, are important skills, you know, not only for being an astronaut, uh, but also just for general life. You know, if, you, if your computer breaks, you know, it's much better to be able to fix it yourself than have to pay somebody else to fix it. Of course, uh, and take of course. Time without a computer. I mean, my gosh, to be, to be without a computer for five minutes would be terror. <laughs> wow. Well, all I can say, John, is that, you know, for me, I, I'm obviously a huge fan of, of space. Um, I've had the privilege of, of working with, with many people uh, within NASA and, and ESA and, and other organizations. I'm always intrigued when I, when I speak to people who are, it's in their bones. It really is something they're passionate about. I mean, you're not just, you know, speaking about space like, oh, well, you know, I've been to space. I mean, you re it is something that you really, really are passionate about. And I think that when it comes to promoting STEM and, and other related topics, it's very important that we expose kids to people who've actually done it and, and speak from the heart. Because if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching about space, it's one thing, but when you actually get to speak to someone who's been there five times, it brings it onto a whole new level. And of course, you've got young kids, don't you? Well, they're not young anymore. They're in, in oh. college right now. And, uh, I mean, surely you must have been an inspiration for them. Did they move into anything in the sciences because of what you did? One of them is studying uh, material science and engineering, you know, how, how to make new materials that nobody's ever imagined before. Uh, and the other one is in mechanical engineering. So, Could you have asked for more than that? <laughs> I mean, there we go. You have a wonderful role model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say thank you so much for your time. I know that some of the classes had to leave and we've still got quite a few people who are watching it live on, on YouTube at the moment. What I would like to do is ask you just to smile so we can get a, a screen grab quickly. A nice big smile. There we go. And one more. Let me just quickly take that little window away. And perfect. And Thanks I'm going to end much. the broadcast. Thanks, Tony. <laughs>